Hi, Mike. Hey, everybody. How you doing, Mike? Doing you all right. snuck in. I did. I snuck in. I just thought, you know, I'd drop by since I saw everybody was here and I was about to do some other stuff. And I thought maybe I'd just drop in and see if anybody had questions that were on the top of their mind uh, that they might want me to be able to answer. Uh, I see that there's a question on the Varus identity thread, and I don't know if that's the top of mind question or if there are others, but um, I think you can stake and on a locked ID and delegate your stakes to another ID. Um, on testnet, it works. I've done it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I thought it worked. Yeah, I was, yeah. I was, I was wondering. I mean, I, I think it should work. Yeah, I mean, it's, I can't see any reason why it shouldn't. Um, or an argument that it shouldn't. Anyways, so if there are other questions, I know there was some stuff about merge mining, but I think that got figured out, if I'm not mistaken. And I'd be happy to answer other people's questions, even anything including, like, how is it going? Or, you know, but I'd rather answer so that I'm not just talking and not knowing for sure what people want to know. So how's your diet, Mike? You eating right? <laughs> <laughs> My guess is that's not the most common question on everybody's mind, but I'm doing all right. Come on, somebody's got to ask it. Everyone's dying to ask the uh, the, the old question. <laughs> when main when testnet is that the one? <laughs> is I'm that, guessing. Yeah. Um, yeah. The the only so here's the thing. I don't 100 percent know because. Uh, it's so ridiculously close. That's the truth. That the like, you know, I mean, it's it's running all the way up. It does merge mine. It, there's no sense right now. Okay, here's where it is. I'll just I'll say I'll say where it is. So you can do launches of of um, regular currencies and do everything you can do today. Uh, you know, on testnet, of course. But it has the right protocol. Like it has the protocol that took all the learning from everything and is now able to be a completely cross chain, same chain or cross chain or cross system or PBAS protocol with automatic um, notarization built into the daemon. So uh, when you define a P right now, so there are some questions actually. Because, uh, you know, I could tell you what are the big challenges, but let me, let me first, before I even get there, they're not big challenges in implementation, they're big challenges in questions. Um, okay, so it runs just great, everything, all the way up to even running and merge mining a PBAS chain. And when you start a PBAS chain, along the way, this has been merging the cross-chain protocol with Ethereum turned out to be a much bigger scope than I realized at the time, but it was so much the right thing to do, so much, because it's the same protocol. You know, Ethereum uses different proofs, so there's going to be different hex bytes, but everything about the back and forth and efficient, you know, cross-chain, cross-system transactions works across PBAS chains across other, like Ethereum, you'll be able to take those contracts and plug them into any Ethereum-like system or clone um, and make that easy. But the kind of the biggest thing about it is that so right now, get all the way to, I can merge mine. Now I have two chains running, you know, or multiple, it'll merge mine multiple chains. That's not the issue. And it's really the um, details, not nothing at a high level, nothing of making sure that every you know reference in the cross chain notarizations is correct, and that that whole process is automatic for notaries and everything else. So that is right now. I'm gonna do some egg coloring with my daughter today. You know. Um, and I don't take a lot of breaks, honestly, but that is literally possibly like ready everything 
I don't know, like today or not today, probably because I'm probably not today because of the eggs and then tomorrow I'm going to try and do stuff with family, but you know, Monday or, I mean, and I, and I feel so bad for predicting it to be sooner than it's been, but the choices that were made along the way were not in any way in my mind, they were, they were not just not wrong. They were absolutely what we need to have for the long-term system that everybody needs really. And, uh, and so it is that close, everything that isn't this. So, so like, to, I don't even know if I need to go to the level of the detail of the code, but the point is just that if what we wanted was to do everything we're doing on testnet today, plus be able to do PBAS launches, um, plus be able to run the PBAS chains independently and know that the protocol is basically in shape, but or is done actually, not basically in shape. But I don't know for sure if there's going to be a data change on the protocol that isn't there yet. And if there is, then it would mean another reset right after we do it. You know what I mean? And so, um, and and so now that we know it. it like this stuff really all is there and it really does work and get to this point and the merge mining works. And the question about merge mining was, you know, how do you determine the difficulty? All the chains that merge mine together have their own independent difficulty and the Varus chain could conceivably have a lower difficulty than another chain, though I don't envision that typically being the case. Um, the, the uh, system as it is, is extremely close and I don't, no, because I've literally truly been wrong every time for one reason or another. And it just, you know, it's hard, but it's also not less exciting that things are actually working as really well as they're working and everything is doing what it's supposed to be doing. So, um, yeah, maybe that's an answer. I don't know if it's the answer everybody wanted. Um, but really, you know, any day, and I'll still make colored eggs with my daughter today. So that's that's really where it is. Um, when we, when, yeah, does that does that answer anyone's question about it? Yes, thank you. Yeah, yes. yeah it gives us a good feeling of uh, you know the state of play. Okay, yeah. all right, good. So so here's gotta, some. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I had another question. Uh -huh. the, um, uh, the the well, I wouldn't say problem, but the the, the challenge with the uh, fees for uh, tokens or coins crossing a bridge. Wait, I didn't hear the first part. Have I? I heard the part. I heard the subject of what it's about, but I didn't hear the question relating to it. Okay, how did you uh, solve the uh, the challenge with the fees? That if you buy oh, what, a, what uh, challenge? Let me understand the challenge. Uh, for most systems, if you buy an ERC-20 token, you need to have Ethereum in order to, to send or receive it. Yeah. And uh, Well, because, you, on uh, Ethereum, because on Ethereum, you need to have Ethereum to send or receive it. That's kind of the way it is, right? So we can't yeah. actually make that not the case on Ethereum. Um, but what we do is what we do just, I don't know if this solves the problem you're thinking about or not. Um, so, okay, maybe I should go through what happens when you launch a currency or a gateway and the process of launching a gateway, like what, um, is going to be similar, but it's, there are some questions about this. Okay. So if you launch a currency, Right now, a PBA, uh, uh, sorry, everybody, well, everybody who's used testnet knows what it's like to launch a regular currency, a token, okay, a DeFi token or, or just a token. Um, you can do centralized, decentralized, etc. Okay, if you launch a currency, uh, like a blockchain now, a PBAS chain, it's really just a lot like launching a currency, a lot, um, pretty much the same, actually. It's just you use a few different options, you know, and, and you have another 
important thing. So when you're going to do this blockchain, it's got its own currency, which might be used, well, it is used for its security. That's how blockchains work. It's got its own native currency, which is required to secure that blockchain. Okay. And, and after a, a lot of a kind of evaluation and analysis, that really should be uh, the blockchain's native currency, not a fractional currency. So it's not. Okay. It's like Varus, but for that other blockchain, it's the native currency and it supports ZK snarks and, and it supports all the features actually that Varus will support. Okay. All the basic features. And the um, launch, though, now that you've got two blockchains and they have different native currencies, you're kind of in the exact same situation as you are with ETH and Varus. Even though you might not think that way because everyone thinks of ETH really big and Varus not as big, but you know, Varus has an unlimited number of tokens and currencies on it, and, and so will any blockchain in the Varus PBAS ecosystem. And so basically, um, it's a system, and it's really kind of the same because they each have their own native currency. When you send from one blockchain to another, you know, there's every blockchain has its own wallets and its own, you know, assumptions. And the assumption is you can send currency using the native currency as the fee. You can do that on Ethereum and you can do that on Testnet on Verus. Um, there are some cases where you don't need other currencies, including the native currency. I'll explain them. But just think of that as, you know, it's the part of the security model of a blockchain. It's required. And actually, part of the problem that happened on Ethereum, in my opinion, is that the whole system of Ethereum got so separated from what it is to be a blockchain that it's like not the same thing exactly now. And so, um, so we have now these two blockchains, the Varus chain and this PBAS chain that someone has launched. And they need a way to talk by sending back and forth. And if these are two economies or they represent two kind of micro economies or something, you really want to solve that fee problem once and for all with the protocol. And that's what we do. So when you launch the PBAS chain, you have an option because the PBAS chain might be used for many different things, but you have an option of also launching simultaneously a fractional bridge currency for that PBAS chain it will be the same thing for a gateway. All right. This fractional bridge currency is um, going, it's, it runs on the new chain. Actually, it doesn't run on Varus for a few reasons. One, because Varus isn't all about taking rent, number one. And number two, uh, it scales much better when the whole system kind of spreads to the edges, okay? But it still contributes to the entire connected economy. And so the way that it works is you launch a new PBAS chain and you define two currencies, the main PBAS currency, and you define the emission schedule and you define all these things. And then you define actually the system defaults and gives you this default of a dual currency basket, 100% backed fractional currency that will live on the new chain. And that is the bridge converter basically for this new chain. And now a couple things about these, this simultaneous dual currency launch, which works just great. Um, when you do that, you only need one ID because the blockchain is your ID and you get another ID minted automatically in the name of the new currency that is the fractional bridge. You also can modify this new currency in every way that you could modify any fractional currency. So it can actually have other currencies in it. It can be, you know, it can, it can have a pre-allocation to a foundation. You know, it can do all these different things. And then um, in talking to Allbits recently, he kind of highlighted the importance of one of the things that you know, so right now, when you do pre-allocations, you can pre-allocate to time-locked IDs. And when the new chain is made, 
all of the IDs that are necessary, including notary IDs, uh, pre-allocation IDs, currency definition IDs are transferred over to this new chain automatically. They're imported at launch. So they exist on both that time. And that can make it possible for you to actually um, have like absolutely locked, not revocable or recoverable, just locked, stakeable uh, pre-allocations as part of a launch as well. And and so um, this is basically a way that now we, now that you have this converter, then instead of sending a currency to you know the native chain without a converter, you can send it through the converter and it'll arrive on the native chain, and the converter converts the fee from the source system's currency to the destination system's currency and pays the miners in the destination system's fee. And so because we can do these micro conversions on the protocol, they, that just handles the fee differences. So, you know, if you're on the new chain, then it's interesting because, you know, there's a fee, there's a cost, there's going, there's got to be, and there will be a cost for starting a currency on Verus. And there are, number of reasons for that and it's going to all as always go back to miners stakers and uh and interestingly it's going to go right in back into the ecosystem of the currency that people start as well and so the way that that works is the fee that you pay for a currency um is divided right now on the first test net there's um because it's not an important factor for the first test net the division isn't happening the way that I expect, but it's divided between the people who on Verus helped to make it launch and the people who power the new chain. And, um, you know, I don't believe it will be at all good for our ecosystem to have a million new chains right off the bat because we really need people to understand what they're doing because these are not trivial things when you make a new blockchain project, I don't believe that's a trivial thing. And I really think that there should be a reason for it. And so um, I think that one way to reduce the number of chains that start is we probably need to set a, a very high price um, for a chain launch and a lower price for, you know, just a currency definition. But when you do a chain launch, um, the fees, a large part of the fees end up going into the fee pool of the new chain and are paid out to miners and stakers on the new chain as well, not just to Varus. Some goes to Varus and some goes to the new chain. And so I really, looking at the fees, even now, what we're testing with, and the, you know, before, before it really makes, like we want to get it, we want to make it public when we believe that we, the protocol won't need any data changes whatsoever. Um, or if so, just one more before mainnet, that's it. Because otherwise it's just going to cost too much going back and forth. And so, um, you know, right now with fees that are not near what I think they should be to launch a chain, because I think it, it should actually be somewhat a barrier because we only, I think it would be best for the, for the project, the community, and the whole world using this technology to get a small number of chains at first because um, of the cross-chain notarization model. And I'll explain that in a minute. Um, but that fee going into mining and staking is going to make it that no Varus network um, miner or staker in their right mind would miss the launch of a new PBAS chain because, you know, this new fee pool and the IDs and the currencies and the chains and the way this is working is it's just, there is going to be a time, I'm sure, when the block rewards will just simply will not matter at all. And then it will need no inflation for this. I mean, of course, it's the, the schedule is set, but, um, you know, 
when a new chain starts up, all of the fees that go into the new chain are going to be coming out for those people who are supporting the launch of that new chain in different ways. You know, long enough and, and enough over and above any of the normal mining and staking rewards that it's going to be a big deal among people who um, are mining and staking. I don't think there's any way it cannot be or it, it will not be. Anyways, uh, the fees cross system are kind of assumed in most uh, high scale, high usage scenarios to go through a bridge currency. The bridge currency, for example, on the um, Ethereum bridge is going to be uh, is going oh, is going to be. Um, sorry, I had to move my cat out of the door instead of back and forth. Um, the bridge currency on the Ethereum is going to be right. The expectation is a Dai Ethereum Varus fractional bridge currency, and that would allow you if you could. So if you could send from Varus to Ethereum, you could do that with uh, DAI, just DAI. Um, if you could send from Ethereum to Varus, I think you're going to have to use Ethereum. Uh, it's, you know, you can kind of think of it as most likely on any system, you're going to probably need the native currency of that system to help power whatever it is you're doing. Uh, another exception to that is on... So on a PBAS chain, um, they will be able to accept Varus as a fee currency. Um, that's the only real exception because, or actually, it's not really just going to be Varus. So this is going to be a fractal system, meaning, you know, Varus will launch lots of, like, can launch chains, but then each of the chains that are launched by Varus will be able to do the same. And uh, not probably on the first mainnet release, but shortly after that. And the um, so there's not really going to be a limit to the scale. And all of the protocol that these systems are using will be able to bridge, you know, to shortcut through the big worldwide tree of all the different, you know, however many blockchains and systems there end up being. They'll all be able to bridge and be interoperable with the same protocol. And so, um, you know, there's, there's, there need, needed to be a solution to being able to just send in some decentralized way using the current native currency as your fee currency and have it power the things that you want to have happen on the other side. And so the way that we've done that is we made it so that um, you can have your converter, your bridge converter on either side. So with Ethereum, we have it on Varus. The bridge converters on Varus, and that's going to be that you know Tricoin bridge, maybe bridge .veth, I don't know the name of it yet. Um, and then uh, on a PBAS chain, just because it's kind of in the spirit of the growth of the entire decentralized system, and the fact that this is a worldwide protocol for everyone, and that there really isn't a reason not to use this system over something else that I can think of. You know, when someone starts a new chain. The DeFi and the converter and the ID system and all the other stuff is on their new chain. And because the entire system is connected so that like value can flow across the systems kind of like water, then, you know, it'll be the projects that are really worth value that will have higher values. Now, this kind of touches on the, the cross chain um, notarization model and why I think we probably shouldn't, why I think it's the right model, but also why I think we probably should uh, take it easy on expecting to get lots and lots of new chains or even wanting that to happen right away. I think we would want a very small number of very high quality projects, very small, like definitely single digit. And it's very small because otherwise, I mean, we don't have tons of people who are going to be able to help people with every different idea that many different projects will have. And at first, so the cross chain notarization protocol is very similar, but more developed than, you know, about 
but two years ago we did the the fly client um i know it wasn't quite two it was a one and three quarter years i guess the fly client uh, cross chain notarization protocol that was automatic and that used a kind of a proof a cryptographic proof cross chain and the problem i had a problem with that at the time you know that we didn't have the time to really go in and do the deep analysis and the hardening to make sure that we could provably state the statistical chance of anyone being able to defeat it and and without that kind of a proof then you know the only other option is to say well you need some form of either mining staking or notarization and a model what do the what is the mining staking and notary what does it have to do all it has to do is it has to validate that one chain is true okay and the reason that that is not something that's easily solved with just the automatic protocol although we we know how to solve it it's just we're not going to have it in this first release is that um on a worldwide network you literally have to know that a chain that you haven't seen is both valid and accessible to everyone or you can't consider it a competitor for the best chain no matter what kind of algorithm you use and when you're doing uh, cross chain notarizations you don't get the whole chain's information to be able to make that decision and so you have to do it based on um it's like a zero knowledge proof actually it's very similar to a zero knowledge proof you don't get to see the whole chain but you get you have to agree that it's correct and so all we need to know for any cross chain uh operation that isn't dependent on um anything else is if that is in fact the correct chain and so that is all that notaries which are part of a currency definition now that's their job is simply to have a group of some authorities who have the responsibility of uh agreeing that that is the other chain okay now um for a lot of different chains that start up if a, if a lot of different chains start up and that's the model you know you could say all right well of course that's the right model if somebody wanted to start the JP Morgan chain and and they're going to have a group of you know financial companies they're going to be their own notaries they wouldn't have it any other way and it's still going to be a blockchain system and it's still going to be completely decentralized you know but it's but they're the ones who put their name behind the notarization that that's all correct okay you you, you kind of have to let people be able to do that and then we've had people say this is that you have to be able to do it. but at the same time once you have this model until people in the world understand what this really is if you don't have a cryptographic proof the ability to prove that a group of notaries aren't actually trustworthy just to even state that something's true then um you could have people starting pbas chains and misrepresenting those chains because they could start them with you know a group of malicious notaries hand picked and 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 it's important for us to not allow any project that we are as a community supporting or connected to or anything else it it, it can't there can't be something like when when this is fully done and open and and not as not too expensive to be prohibitive and people can start chains what we're going to need to have is a way to allow people to cryptographically prove the notarization and the notaries have less responsibility and less power um to state that something's true that isn't uh and there's going to have to be some education of people to know that um that they should trust a system that they interact with you know just like every currency that is on ethereum isn't it's decentralized you know you have to trust that project that currency it's going to be that way but 
I think we need to ease. This is a new thing, being able to create a new blockchain with its own DeFi system right off the bat, which just starts off as a project, which you can even, you know, you're not issuing currencies when you do it's got it. When you start one of these PBAS chains, you have the ability to do the Kickstarter, you know, set the minimum participation on either the bridge or the native currency if you're going to offer the native currency. You don't have to offer the native currency for sale or, or not for sale, for conversion to, uh, for participation in when you launch. One way of launching, which is supported and works, which everyone will get to try when it's out on testnet is um you can you start a pbas chain and people participate in the bridge currency and you issue currency from the pbas chain so a pre-mine that doesn't go to any person it actually goes into the bridge currency so the people who participate in the bridge currency at launch now automatically get some additional reserve in the currency they're holding it actually uh is one of the reasons why you might want to have a time lockup period for early participants or you might want to actually uh take you know funding for a foundation or something because when that happens um it's effectively a process of world you know decentralized worldwide pricing of the new currency and when that happens the market cap of the bridge currency is going to increase at that moment by the percentage that is injected from the uh, PBAS chain. And so uh, it's, a, it's a little bit complicated. I'm not going to try to explain it all, but it's actually simple in a certain way as well because it all just kind of makes sense and it is very, very powerful. But the bottom line is that, you know, you, you'll be able to launch a project that is its own project that has its ability to connect to all the crypto networks that doesn't need Binance or Coinbase or anybody else because it's direct, it's tapped directly through its bridge currency that runs on its own chain that gets its own fees and it's tapped directly into the worldwide economy and it just better be a worthwhile project or everybody's just going to sell it and leave. And so um, if it is a good project, it's going to grow and that is a way that you know, really, truly decentralized networks of pretty much blockchain systems of any size is going to be able to grow this way. I'm sorry, I just kind of went off on a tangent. So I'll stop and let uh, people continue with any questions. How, how does that work with centralized uh, data sources, the, the bridge? Yeah, I mean, it can be centralized. So you just Either. have to, you just have to run a centralized if the uh, virtual machine and just no, I mean it can be centralized. You you can make centralized uh, controllable PBAS chains. You, you know centralized currencies. Yeah, you can have a you can have a gateway. Right now, the gateway to Ethereum uses the exact same protocol as the PBAS protocol, but the proof is different. The proof can be different. So, um, you know, you could prove it by just verifying the centralized signature yeah a centralized gateway is really just a centralized uh currency regarding the the identities i always had a question about uh, attestations um is that just adding information to a content map would be an attestation you know a provable signature well, so whether or not an attestation is in the content map is actually a, um, an optional thing. An attestation is literally just someone used their digital signature to sign some statement about something about you. That's an yeah. attestation. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah so, I understand so, they could be off chain. So you make a claim and then somebody can sign that claim and... Say, yep, I agree. And it can be a company or an authority. It could be vaccinated, whatever it is. But our model allows you to make a set of claims as part of a Merkle Mountain range. And the people can sign a Merkle Mountain range, which can be effectively completely zero knowledge to those who you don't disclose it to. And you can disclose any of the independent elements 
that you've divided up into that Merkle Mountain range of that was signed without disclosing any of the others. Yeah. So if if I had a piece of data like uh, that you gave me, and I and um, I signed it, I put it in my content map. I could prove I own that piece of data, and I have the power to sign it for like a some kind of. No, no, that doesn't prove that. No. Um, because you took some data and you signed it. So you can do that to any data in the world. But if so I if put you wanna... the signature in the content map as well as the data... No, no, no. Prove... if you want to prove that you own something, then there has to be some kind of uh, original kind of verification of the creator of the content. Or the original, like, it depends on how you want to prove it. Do you want to prove it legally or do you want to prove it uh, with some, you know, NFT kind of model? Or do, how do you want to prove it? Because the, the problem is, like, NFTs right now, you know, I'm a little bit concerned about the fact that they think that they own everything, but it's a little bit weird because nobody's reconciled the law with the blockchain. And yet they're saying they own it because of law, actually obeying what you know but the blockchain is where all the transactions are happening and it's interesting that there doesn't seem to be any solution that i've seen so far as to you know what does it really mean when you say you own a certain piece of art i think it means that people will recognize you as the owner isn't that true yeah i think there's just in the ula of the platform at the moment that but it's not no, no but i'm but i mean yeah. uh you know if it's if it's not centralized then or there's not it's you know the as they say in central in decentralized systems the code is the law in a certain way it's like well with nfts it's like the the code's really exciting you can buy and sell all these things but they're like they're just really it didn't give you special protection it just gave you a mechanism as long as you have legal protection as well you know what i mean and yeah, so all I'm saying, all I'm saying is if you want to really prove that you own something without like kind of a supra legal way, if you want to prove that you own something, then there has to be some, uh, you know, original owner of that thing. Someone has to have a root of recognition of ownership of that thing that they would recognize and usually that's going to include some kind of attestation by someone else of your thing of your data and of your id associated with that data do you know what i mean yeah i i this see to give you some context I, I was thinking about like a user and a platform scenario where the user has their id and then the platform wants to grant permission to the user to say yes you can use our platform and then i get a proof back and then everyone can see that proof in my metadata that yes indeed that platform has signed some data he's given the you know well uh, yeah another another option is you know that whole idea of the poor man's copyright and all that that was you know i don't, I don't know how it works these days but the idea was you know you send something to yourself with a postmark and then it's like it's copyrighted because you proved that no one else had it earlier than that. And I mean, you can do that as well, that kind of a proof of ownership where you could sign something stating, asserting that you created it, for example, that it's yours and put it into your content map. And, you know, the only way that you could argue anyone could uh, challenge your ownership would be with an earlier, some kind of an earlier proof or something like that. So there could be a model like that but i'm just saying that um it, it works a lot like in you know off the blockchain in a certain way signatures do but in another way you can do a lot more with them and you really if you're gonna establish like an an nft ownership of some thing then there's got to be some kind of i think establishment of kind of original Providence and you know some way of um, of having a cryptographic association there and right now I think in all general cases that I'm aware of that's typically done with some 
attestation by some or multiple authorities that are recognized as having a right to do that, or, or at least uh, trusted to do that. Am I wrong? I might have gone on a different tangent, because I was just thinking about like a simple logon for a, a music pla- streaming service platform, not, not NFTs per se, just you know authentication to, al- to allow me to use the platform uh, just to, say, download music and play it. Okay, so you're Monkins yeah. and you just want to sign in? Yeah. Oh, that's no. easy. Oh, we're actually, okay, so that's very different. I'm sorry. So if you just want to sign in, then all that has to happen is, um, you know, you say you're Monkins, right? And that includes, that can include, you know, private communications with you because you could have published the Z address, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. All right. And uh, the only thing you need to do to prove that you're Monkins is they just give you a challenge. Yeah. And you sign it off chain. You don't put it in your content map. You sign it with Monkin's current signature ability. Give it to them and they can just validate it. Yep. So I thought. And then there's like, they don't have to even, they can just make a cookie and they don't even have to keep track of you in their database. If I mean, they could just put Monkin's in, but they don't need to keep any personally identifiable data or anything. I'm sorry. I thought you were trying to establish yeah, ownership it, of I, something. I was discussing with someone about a, a, a streaming platform about how you had a login, but then just also prove. A, then once you start to use their platform and you start to download, say MP3s for example, and they give you a link to IPFS, if that was a, a customized link that only um, you could prove that you have the rights to. Then... Well, actually, they could just make a hashed a content, a new content with you know specific information related to you, which would create a new hash, a content addressable hash, and that could be what they give you, and then you would be able to look it up, which would give you access to that. I mean, there are there are like yeah. someone has to design it. There are, there are of course, a lot of, yeah. of like steps along the way, but it's all pretty you know fairly easily easy to do. The one thing I'll mention is that um, a company that uh has been working along with Varus um on some you know the idea of a launch at some point um they wanted wallet connect support if you're familiar with wallet connect it's an ethereum uh like it's it's interesting because it's an ethereum spec basically came out of the ethereum community and they run wallet connect servers but it isn't bound to ethereum and so we looked at the spec and we thought, oh, that looks great to support. And so basically what that does is it allows web services and applications to be able to connect back, say, to your mobile wallet or other things and to actually request that you do something like, you know, approve. But, you, of course, you would never do anything that you didn't know what you're doing because it comes from the wallet. And so like to approve a certain, um, you know, uh, download of music or who knows what. Um, but you could that model actually kind of includes a login model as well. And so I think Michael Toot Jr., I don't know if he's on the call, he's probably not on the call. I think they're, yeah, um, uh, was looking at that and we didn't really see any reason why we, we wouldn't want to support that in the wallet. So there are a number of ways to do that, but it doesn't require lots of blockchain intensive stuff usually. The IDs themselves give you a lot of power to do signatures, digital signatures, revocable, all these different things, you know. All of that is already there that you can just use, and it's just like an anchor. You don't need to post things on the blockchain or update your ID for a lot of things. And an attestation doesn't have to be on the blockchain, you know. Yeah, because it's yeah, just a... It's, a once it's made, it's an attestation, yeah. and yeah, yeah. Nice. Well, th- th- uh, thanks for coming out, and uh, happy Easter. and. Um, I have a question about the how you see once the launch happens of the main net, how, how you see the, particularly with the bridge and the DeFi, DeFi going forward, how does that uh, grow in your mind? Like, how do, how do you see it growing? Um, there's going to be DAI and F in a bridge currency. What about other ERC20 tokens? Will they be able to bridge oh, through oh, that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so so here's the thing. Um, the way that it 
so right now when I start a PBAS chain, you know, I'm importing different currencies and I'm importing different uh, IDs and stuff. And that's actually possible to do. Um, I think the first testnet release of this is probably not going to have the automatic import of different currencies. So you're probably going to need to go through those currencies for a week or two or something like that. Um, but once it's live, you're actually, it's already on the Ethereum contracts. It's already in there. Uh, and it's on the Veris side, but the question is still the command for actually initiating uh, currency going from one side to the other. And it's not like there's code like much to do because it's all the doing, being able to do that is already done. Um, the fee for doing, there's going to be a fee for doing that because it can't be free because nothing, it, this whole thing has to be self-sustaining. It's just a self-sustaining bridge that runs on its own and and so the um you'll be able anyone will be able to poke through any erc20 currency to varus and vice versa anyone will be able to poke through any varus currency to ethereum as an erc20 and uh when you do you'll be able to make various fractional currency baskets out of any combination of erc20s you want and you'll be able to send to those from ethereum and you'll okay, be able to hold those currencies on your IDs and stuff. And if somebody were wanting to create one of those currencies, uh, what would they need? Let's say you were to say, okay, this to, to, to create one, this is what you need. You know you need an ID. Uh, you yeah, you just need, need an ID, it. and it's gonna, there's going to be a fee that it costs, which goes right back into the network for creating the currency. And then you would need to whatever you're going to put into that currency uh, well, you could create a currency that is just a token with no inherent reserves. Yeah, like let's say you want, let's or you say could, you, yeah, you want like an uh, 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 an ERC twenty to be able to just be mirrored over onto Veris. So you just create, yeah, you just make a token and just send it over. And so you would, okay, so you would just send. There's that literally through. nothing harder than that. I mean, you'll be able to just make a token on Veris and just send it over to Ethereum if you want. Oh, no, and I will have an ERC twenty on Ethereum. What's that? I'm I'm I meant the other way around. So that like we. Oh well, any ERC twenty yeah. you can be, you'll be able to send that over to Varus too. But it's a lot harder to make an ERC twenty than it's going to be to make a Varus token. You can do it that way too, but you won't have you know kind of the automatic like ability to do all the other stuff and Kickstarter launch and all that stuff. But you could do it that way. It goes both ways. Right, understood. And then let's say someone let's say someone wants to create a currency. Let's say I want to create a currency out of I have an ERC twenty, any ERC twenty like BAT, and I want to mm -hmm. bring it over to Varus. Mm -hmm. Well, and if it's so already on Varus, you don't have to. But if it's not, then you would be the one who'd have to pay to send it over. That's yeah, and that's what I kind of mean, like uh, in terms of how you see it playing out as it first starts, because uh, there will be. You think more movement will go from Varus to Ethereum, or do you do you see it as people building on Varus the ability for the Ethereum to come over to Varus and then use Varus uh, tools? Well, I think that there's no other system that's going to allow you to hold your bat on an ID that's self-sovereign, revocable, recoverable, and so the people who are happy with Uphold might stick with you know Uphold. Or people might decide that they might want to just stick it on an ID. And uh, if you wanted to convert currencies and knowing that you're getting the same price in all directions and that you got a 0.05% instead of, you know, all the different fees. And if Varus gets busy, that someone's going to make more chains that are going to still be less expensive just to grow as the network grows. I think it might just flow like water, but we'll see. Because it's hard awesome. to see why... Like, I, I don't know why I'd be sending currency over to Ethereum, honestly. I can't think of a reason. Right. Just paying the fee of Ethereum to get it over to Varus will be enough of a pain, uh, perhaps. Hmm, I, I think you'll just be able to move it once, and then you can do everything you want with it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. You I'm can move it back. I mean, you know, you can send it back. And it'll, I mean, even, even if you send from Varus to Ethereum, the largest part of the fee is going to be on the Ethereum side, I'm sure. Uh, I mean, at least now, you know, and if it gets to be really expensive, like say Varus gets to be a thousand dollars a coin or something like that, and this is not an investment advice, it's I'm just talking about, you know, if something like that happens, 
and uh, and it ends up being you know in some way more expensive to use Varus, then people will just make PBAS chains, or you know, I mean, actually any any external currency, whether it's a PBAS chain or another currency that connects to Varus, will also be connected to everything that Varus is connected to. So through this protocol, so I. I think it's, you know, um, I think people will be able to send the currencies to where they have the most ability to, um, you know, benefit from their currencies in whatever different way they feel is important. And, uh, and I think that when we have, you know, we, it's not a secret. We have, you know, a uh, company in the community. Are they on this call? Don't see um you know planning to release a version of the wallet that has oh you guys might want to know about the new wallet too i don't i don't think that's known yet um a version of the wallet that has you know connectivity to uh, fiat on and off ramps in 145 countries and when you're able to send from your bank into pretty much any crypto you want without leaving the various ecosystem or you can if you want. You can go to Ethereum if you want, or you can go to... I don't know. Uh, I, I just... I mean, tell me the reason why I'd want to send stuff over to Ethereum, because I can't see it. I'll just pay... Well, because maybe you want to use the the, the, the the dApps on there? What dApp will I want to use? Because I use, I use Brave right now, and the only thing know. I care about is getting a little bat. But what dApp would I want to use on Ethereum to send it over? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not that uh, into Ethereum. But I mean, maybe I would want to. Maybe I'd want to go into all the different DeFi things, but we'll have, I think, much better solutions. So I don't know. I don't know. Well, I have uh, like a, an, another quick question. Um, mm -hmm. Like, what do you have in mind for the costs of creating a currency and the PBAS chain? Yeah, so that's a good question because uh, so here's the problem. Uh, it will be very hard to support people with the tiny, you know, like amount of developers who know all the protocol that we're going to have if we get inundated with people trying to make lots of projects. And we will not, as a community, and as a like, this system is this is not about trying to sell it, and it's not about trying to get anyone to buy. This system is something very different from what anybody's used to in crypto right now it really is i don't believe this is i don't believe this is the same as what people expect and this is going to give ev there's no more need for getting listed on an exchange for any crypto project ever period that's really true I'm not saying that they won't want to and the exchanges won't exist and make it easier for people and everything else. But this is like a complete solution in a protocol. Well, I'm not really not trying to hype it. I'm really just saying what I think. Um, to solve the flow of value across all of these different systems. And when that is released, we really don't want large numbers of scammers to be able to afford to make blockchains or even five to make blockchains that will end up being a story instead of you know us getting a chance to like get this thing walking before it runs you know what i mean and so uh you know we could Try to figure out different ways to limit the number of chains that people will make and the only way that i think that we could really limit or make sure that chains that start are absolutely serious is to have a large um a large fee requirement you know and like i don't know i i mean uh maybe ten thousand for starting a blockchain i don't know you know if if we end up getting a lot of blockchain starting, that's going to be another issue because, you know, then our currency would explode. And I'm not saying that that's why I would want to do it. I'd actually want to do it to prevent too many chains from starting, you know, because 
we need the system. We need to be able to focus on building an absolutely solid foundation. And everyone talks about documentation, all these things. I know that we need to have a way of explaining all of this, but there's really no point to try to explain it when it really just needs to be done before people will believe it, really. And so when it's working, then actually we really need to stop and, and step back and, and take really the time to try to explain it so that people can under, understand how to use it, even if it's you know about login or if it's about the attestation stuff that Chris is talking about, or if it's about how to make a chain and how to do it in a way where you can really leverage the power that this gives everyone. Like this gives everyone power that people have not had before. And I'm, you know, I'm, I would not like to see us have, a, you know, a challenge in the community with a proliferation of projects because this is, once people figure out what you're able to do with this, um, and the fact that you, it's like, you know, your project starts, it starts with, you know, a Binance listing, a coin. It's, it's like you immediately, when you start a project, you start, do you realize how much energy in our community has been sunk into exchange, dealing with exchanges, having exchanges hacked, you know, like all of the different things, really trying to prove to exchanges that we're even not a scam. And then once we're like clearly not a scam, coming up with all this money for exchanges. Is that really what crypto projects and people trying to figure out how to make things better in the future should spend their energy doing? Okay. Um, so, okay. So the way you're saying it now, it kind of sounds to me that maybe 10,000 is even way too cheap if you really want to start with maybe five in the beginning and then build from there. Yeah, I, well, I don't know. Because, you know, here's the thing. 10,000 means that someone's got to be serious. And I'm not, I don't know if that's too cheap or not. But if someone's going to start it for 10,000, don't you think that means they have to be serious? No, that's definitely true. And and, and it's yeah, it's interesting that you said like the um that 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 goes into the uh, well, basically goes to the miners and stakers, right? So 10,000. Right. So you can so you can figure well, it's going to go to miners, stakers and their notaries, okay? Whoever they define as their notaries who are going to be the ones responsible for making sure that that when they say that that is the correct chain, that it is the correct chain to the other chain. So it's like the or their notaries are the oracle of that. Right now, we're going to. I actually believe that it's important to eliminate the notaries completely over time, but we start there and then we eliminate them with technology. And even if I'm a notary, I'll be eliminated. I really don't care because it's. It's the right way to do it, you know? And so that's the, the issue is that, um, you know, there should be, they need to have a project that people can trust and a notary set that people can trust. And we can't just say that there is, you know, one group of notaries for everybody across the entire Varus ecosystem because it's too big. It's just, that doesn't scale. They can be responsible for ensuring that. But the thing is, so you can kind of figure it that about half of the fees are going to go to the Varus miners and stakers, and half of the fees are going to go to the newly launched chain miners and stakers, you know? Yeah, okay. So let's say 10,000 for a new chain, right? Hypothetically. Then 1,000 for a currency on Varus? Uh, yeah, I was actually no, I, I I was thinking more like five or uh, one hundred in that range because because the uh, the thing about a currency on Varus is that you know it really doesn't um, it, it has a cost in operating on the chain, but it's not like unless you're doing stuff to it, which kind of pays for itself as well. It's not a lot, and so the reason for having a cost of say a hundred. Is just that people don't, you know, proliferate and use them as I, I would hope not to see people proliferating and using them as spam tokens. So we have to get really serious about the whole whitelisting of token thing, you know? Yeah. So, but like the whitelisting would be done through the application. Wallet. Right? But yeah. 
through the wallets. But what I'm saying is that, um, you know, I'd, I'd much prefer if we could create a system that naturally kind of just encourages people to make them if they're really going to do something reasonable with them, but not over like not charge too much because there's not a big overhead on the system for, you know, you could have a million currencies, a trillion. I mean, I mean there's not really I'm not, the blockchain's not long enough for that. But, you know, there's there's not really a limit, a specific limit on the number of currencies you can have. You know what I mean? It's just that uh, I'd like to see. I'd like to not see them just proliferating for no reason at all. So, I mean, maybe a thousand's not unreasonable. I, I don't know. I really, I honestly just don't know for sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it's difficult to uh, come up with something. So, it's very interesting if someone creates a PBAS chain and the 100 blocks after that, the rewards will be quite, quite big. No, no, no. Uh, they start off right away. What do you mean? No, I mean the like it's um, you have like the one hundred fee pool uh, blocks, right? So the way that works is yeah, but it's it, it does it might not work the way you're thinking because um, so what happens is anytime any large amount of fees go into the fee pool, then they stay in the fee pool and they lose one one hundredth every block for long time maybe you know so okay so when a new chain starts like i think i posted a an image of a new chain starting up and that chain had a reward of 12 and it had a fee of 100 for both the bridge converter chain currency which is called bridge.value and the pbas currency which was just value okay and so in that case, I had uh, uh, just the settings were that the fee for both of them was 100. And just with that, so two things happened. One, since I'm launching two currencies, the Varus isn't run through the converter. So you get both the converted Varus from the bridge currency and actual Varus coming out when you're mining on that new chain. Okay. And the native reward instead of 12 was like 20 at the beginning and it was just you know slowly going down because of the people and i was getting uh you know like one varus every block for at first and that's going to go down and down and down and down and that's talking that, that's where we're talking about just a hundred varus as the fee you know what i mean hello um yeah, I don't think I get it because I, I thought the fee pool. So let's say you have the fee pool, right? It's mm -hmm. um, so you get so you create something that costs a hundred. Uh, the hundred goes into into the fee pool, and isn't that then divided like constantly one extra on top of the block? Uh, no, because uh, okay, okay. So first it's one, then it's point nine nine then it's, you know, every time it's going to be a little less. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. And it keeps going for a long time. And, and uh, it's, it's uh, exponential decay. And then the, um, the uh, other factor that caused the... So I was getting both one Varus. I just realized what you're saying. And, and so here's how it worked. The initial currency was a reward of 12. But because of the way the launch worked, it ended up being priced such that it must have had an extra about, because it was 100 Varus that got converted. So it got converted into the native currency, and I was getting about you know 20 at the beginning. So it meant that the uh, initial pricing would have meant that the new currency was about one-eighth of Varus in price. And I was getting an extra Varus, and I was getting more of the initial native currency. Is this? It might be too confusing. I feel like maybe it's. I don't want to yeah, confuse it's, everybody. Yeah, uh, it's a bit confusing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I probably just have to see uh, how it plays out in real life. Yeah, I, I just want to. I do want to get it out there ASAP for everybody to try it out. So, um, sorry, I've just been talking a lot. So, if there are any other uh, things that people might want to know. Hey, Mike, um, are you guys going to be bridging the Tezos or Binance Smart Chain? We're not going to bridge to 
probably ourselves, we're going to bridge to Ethereum, and I think everybody's going to want to bridge to Verus. So that's kind of the plan. I we'll see what happens if I'm wrong, but I don't think that's. I think that's like it's going to be so easy for people to bridge because it's it's an API to bridge, and we're going to have contracts in Ethereum that bridge to us. And so, you know, we're going to have a lot of stuff to do. And I just don't think those are going to matter as much uh, once this is right. I really don't think that's going to matter as much. I'm not, you know, we can come back and talk about it after the fact. Uh, but you might agree at that point. We'll just find out. I'm not trying to dismiss your interest in it. It's just that, you know, we're going to finish the work that we're doing to bridge to Ethereum. We're going to be connected in a way that's going to be really easy to cross the boundary in both directions. We're going to have all the capabilities that we're soon going to have on testnet, on mainnet. And at that point, I'd be really surprised if we have to focus on bridging to another chain. But we'll help Thanks people. for the time. Yeah. yeah. And, if, and if that is an issue, then we can talk about it. But we'll certainly help people. So the, the, probably the first real PBAS chain will be value, I, I suppose. Um, do you have any ideas or hints on other projects that you might have heard of that may be interested? I know about other projects that I can't talk about. I just simply can't. And actually, that's kind of... Right now, I don't believe that... Like, I know everybody wants to see traction and everybody wants to see a partnerships. And I, I don't believe that's really where we need to be. Like, we just need to finish. I really believe we just need to finish. And, uh, you know, there are people who want and need to use this, I believe. And yes, I can think of two very serious projects wanting to do it, but I don't want to make any promises. Or, and whatever they do is what they decide, because I honestly think that if they do or don't do it, it won't matter. I'm not saying that I don't care about them. I like them both. And I, and I want them to use the system. And I think it will be really good for them if they do once it's running. I just don't think it will matter as much for what happens in the long run for the Verus protocol. And that's my opinion. And, you know, if it turns out that I'm wrong, of course, we'll have time to change and do things differently. Because right now we know what we have to do, which is to get this technology into people's hands. Oh, and then I didn't, uh, I should just mention, um, there is a mobile wallet that is uh, on, basically it's, Ready, it's been ready pretty close to ready to release. There's one uh blocker which is on an upgrade. There was a an upgrade where somebody um in testing had some problem on an upgrade with their existing mobile wallet. But the mobile wallet, we decided to go ahead and release it when that is completely figured out and addressed or turns out not to be an issue. Um and it supports uh, Z addresses, and uh, and it support. It doesn't have the full ID and multi currency support in yet. But what it does is something that basically other wallets uh, have tried to do with IDs, and we're going to make it much better when we put the full ID support in. We need to finish the. Um, uh, basically, we need to finish the PBAS work that I'm doing now in order to have an efficient completion of the IDs in mobile. So, uh, which shouldn't take long once that's done, because there's just like a, one step. But what it will do is it'll look up any ID, so you can actually use IDs to send to any blockchain, um, and to send Z addresses as well. Uh, I, I'm going to have to go in a minute. What it, what it will do is it'll um, look up the ID, and it will uh, use that address as your destination address on any compatible blockchain. Um, so basically, you could import your WIF key from... It's either the one that's in your wallet, or you could import your WIF key. But you can, you know... So that will allow anyone to send to someone with an ID to any of the currencies. Um, and I think we're only going to support Z addresses on Varus right at first. But we have the ability to add other coins. It's just that it's going to take a little bit of work, and it, that's not done yet. So that's just pending, waiting to release that mobile release. And that is the foundation of the mobile release that 
will be the first one with the connections to uh, fiat accounts as well. That's the expectation. Uh, so maybe they'll come out right around the same time around with the new test net. I don't know. I'm going to have to ask if there's any kind of quick thing, and then I probably have to run. Thanks for your time. So much appreciated. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you. All right. All right. Cheers. Take care. See you later. Thanks. Okay. Have, have fun painting. Thank you. <laughs>